This is Jerry Fry, audio historian of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. The following is the professional history of a PPB member, told by himself in his own fashion on February 14th, 2011. These interviews are being recorded in order to compile firsthand a living history of the members of our organization and stories of their professional experiences. Many of our members began in what is called the golden age of radio and television. And this is an attempt to preserve as much of data as possible for succeeding generations. This recording is not intended for broadcast without first obtaining permission from Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. With me today at the Toluca Lake Tennis Club in Burbank, California, is Alan Paris. Alan is the Chief Operating Officer, is that correct, Alan, of the Television Academy. And we're delighted to have you with us to talk a little bit about uh, your life and times being Alan Paris. I'm, uh, I'm delighted that you decided to interview me. I uh, don't go back to the golden age of radio unless it's listening to the golden age of radio. But I've always loved radio and subsequently television. I hope so, because you're in that business. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, let's start way right back at the beginning. Tell us where you were born, when you were born, where, and... Uh, a little bit about your growing up period. Uh, I was born on January 15, 1942, in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, my parents were older parents. I was an only child to a mother who was 35 and a father who was 50 when I was born. Really? Uh, yes, and uh, they were very loving parents. Uh, we had very little money. Uh, I was raised in Cleveland till I was in about the seventh grade. And then my parents had the brilliant idea to move us to Shaker Heights, Ohio, a very well-to-do suburb. There was a section in Shaker Heights, Ohio, where there were five blocks of two- and three-family homes. Mm. Most kids in Shaker Heights lived in mansions or very well-to-do homes, but there was this little section at the beginning of that suburb that had these two- and three-family homes. And we were able, it changed my life, because I do remember being in school in Cleveland, where there were fights in the schoolyard every afternoon. The discussion was what technical school you're going to go to. And by moving into Shaker Heights, all they said was what college you're going to go to. A mm. major change in my life. Quite a change. And as a friend of mine who grew up in that same area told me at a reunion once, weren't our parents terrific for thinking enough of us to get us into a different kind of school system? That was really outstanding. It was terrific, and I thank them for that. Uh, I'll bet. We... Uh, I actually uh, wore hand, some hand-me-down clothes, and it, just, it was fun, though, because you have love in your house, and you're surrounded by your friends, so things, growing up was pretty good. Now, you're going to school with a lot of more wealthy children oh, yes. than you. Yes. Did that pose any problems for you? Not really, because my friends were kind of from my five-block area. Oh, they were? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. We didn't, it wasn't a lot of intermingling. I, I tell you, the fun part is, uh, once I drove my nine-year-old family car to high school, and the kids all said, oh, you got a car. And they're the ones who were driving brand new, uh, brand new cars to school that was their very own. Mm. I was driving my nine-year-old parents' car. We actually went for a few years without a car at all. My father was a cigar salesman who went from drugstore to drugstore selling cigars for a company where he carried the merchandise in the back of a panel truck. Mm. And uh, he worked for them 40 years. He only had an eighth grade education. He was an immigrant from Russia and just a loving, wonderful man. Uh, and there were, there were a few years there where we had no car. So the family, the three mm. of us, would go out in the cigar truck mm. <laughs> as our wow. means of transportation. I bet that was a nice smelling truck. It was. It really smelled good. I but bet. I'd never been a smoker in my life, and neither was my dad. Mm -hmm. But uh, he did sell a lot of cigars. Well, how did he get into the cigar business? I guess uh, in the 20s, when he was looking for work and was a young man, uh, he just kind of fell into it. Mm. And he stayed with that company 40 years till he retired. Fair to say. So, uh, and your mother? Uh, and my mother was a dental hygienist at one point, but when she got married to my father, as most people did in the 30s and 40s, she became a housewife, full-time mm -hmm. housewife. It was good to have a mother at home when you came home. Yes. So it was a pretty normal family. Oh, good. And I remember we lived on the second floor of this two-story house uh, where we watched our black-and-white television mm -hmm. in our living room. 
I remember the first 10 years of my life was only radio because we didn't get a TV until I was about 10. Uh, and I just loved listening to the Jack Bennys and, and the shows, mostly comedy shows on the radio. So I had a pretty good perspective on what came in the 40s because I, for some reason, remember everything that mm. I listen to on the radio. And we got a TV set in 1952, and I remember being an avid TV watcher and always wanting to be doing something in radio or TV. Really? That was right. an ambition From yours. the time I was a young kid. Uh, I think originally, though, I wanted to be a disc jockey, but I never got the voice for it, because back then you had to have a good voice. But, uh, yeah, a good voice and a deep voice. Yes, yeah. and so uh, that went away. Mm -hmm. But I did uh, graduate high school and go to the Ohio State University in Columbus, a state school, because I couldn't afford to go to a, a more expensive school, mm -hmm. and uh, studied um, what was called then radio TV. And to please my mother, who was worried about going into anything that didn't have tenure, mm -hmm. I also got a degree in teaching English ah. because she wanted me to either be working for the government or... <laughs> <laughs> or being a teacher with tenure, uh -huh. because as parents who went through the Depression, she was wondering, why do you want to go into television? Can't you get yeah. fired in those jobs? Sure. And uh, when you love something, you go for it. Um, the television was very, very new. And, it uh, was, uh, it was mm -hmm. in a, it sort of, it was still, yes, it was still in black and white, let's yeah. put it that way. And there were a lot of local programs. And uh, I, uh, I enjoyed doing shows even in college. And uh, television shows, television or? shows, television production. We oh. had we had some of that over at Ohio State where uh -huh. you could do that. And uh, uh, I virtually worked my way through college and got out and owed money. Uh, but the beauty was I had a college degree, which got me to running camera at the public station in Cleveland, next to the eighth grade dropout that was running camera next to me. Oh my gosh! <laughs> but yeah, yeah. eventually, I think he's still running camera, and I moved on to uh, a, bigger, a bigger career. Was there some? Was there some radio show that you remember as being uh, one that you aspire, either aspired to or would love to go see, be produced? Oh uh, well, the the pinnacle of all radio shows to me was the Jack Benny show. Uh -huh. I, I never missed it, even in my uh, doddering old age. Now I collect. Jack Benny radio shows. Do you? I have hundreds and hundreds, maybe more. And you could picture all of those things happening. I can happening. picture it. It was just a well-written show based on the human foibles as opposed to the situation comedy. Yeah. And I loved it because you would be laughing at the joke before it even came because you knew the people's personalities <laughs> so well. Right, right. And uh, uh, <laughs> I, I'm just a child of the industry. Always loved it. Uh, I was focused where I had friends who didn't know what they wanted to do when they even got out of college. I was focused on wanting to be in uh, radio or TV when I was like uh, 12 years old. So, What was the first television show that you just really couldn't miss? You had to watch it every time. Well, if you really want to go back to the howdy duties of the world, that anything, anything that moved. I yeah. actually remember watching Test Patterns, mm. waiting for the station to come back on the air with their early <laughs> evening stuff. And keep adjusting the horizontal and vertical knob. <laughs> but uh, Never, my, I worked for a guy once up in Sacramento, one of radio tele, uh, television director and announcer, and we were going to a full hour of local news. And I said to the boss, "Who the heck's going to watch a full hour of local mm -hmm. news?" And he said, "Jerry, if it wiggles, they'll watch." <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you just reminded me that. Uh, when I was a kid, Milton Berle was very important to watch. Yes. And I took piano lessons, and I had to practice a half hour every night at a uh, stand-up piano, I forgot, upright, upright piano we had in our living room. Mm -hmm. And uh, you couldn't watch TV unless you practiced your piano. And it was one warm night in the spring where I was out on the street playing with my friends, and I came in and it was a quarter to eight. And I had to sit down and practice a half hour piano. And I asked my mother, could I stop at eight to go watch Milton Berle? And she said, you have to do a half hour of piano. Mm -hmm. And it's these little traumatic things in your memory. I sat there crying for the entire half hour of practicing the piano <laughs> that I couldn't see the beginning of the Milton Berle show. Oh, dear. And no TiVos back then. You, no. you miss it, you miss it. You 
That's it. It's gone forever. <laughs> That's correct. Unless they happen to have a summer rerun, and that was pretty unique in those days, too. Right, right. So anyway, I uh, got it. My first job out of college was I worked at the public station in Cleveland, doing everything from running camera and eventually getting to direct some shows and uh, mailing tapes, being a traffic manager. It was mm. all kind. Of, it was everything. Everything. Do you remember what model cameras you were running? No, but they were so huge that I remember we had a field zoom in the studio on one camera. Oh, you did? Where you had to reach all the way all back right. behind you and move it forward and back on a rod. Yeah. That I remember. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the cameras. They were black and white. Sure. And we had some other cameras where we had a dis uh, We did high school football games, and I was a cameraman who had to disassemble his camera downstairs, oh, lug it to the top of the stadium, and put it back together again. Ah. And that's how we did our football games every week. That's, Little, where the, that's where the field zoom came in handy. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, it, it was good because I got to learn uh, on equipment that was probably from the, the 50s, but then I had an exposure to them. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, there was a new station that came to Cleveland, the first independent station in Cleveland. And uh, uh, I called over there to see if they had any jobs, and uh, they said, what can you do? And I say, well, I direct, and they found that I only direct talking heads and science, kid, fifth grade science shows. That wasn't exactly what they were looking for. Yeah. They said, what else do you do? I said, I'm a traffic manager. Well, at a public station, a traffic manager is uh, 59 minutes of Masterpiece Theater and one minute of Smokey the Bear. <laughs> but they were looking for a traffic manager to handle 2,000 commercials a week. How did you know what that was? Well, I, I knew what it was. You didn't know what I it knew was. what it was. And they were willing to take a chance on me. So yeah. I went over as the traffic manager. So here I am, a kid about two years out of college, and I'm, quote, a manager with a staff. Mm -hmm. which, sure. Uh, and there were like three or four of us, and we worked very hard, and we put the station on the air. We had to wait for the Indians at that point to finish building the tower uh -huh. in the middle of winter in Cleveland. Hmm. And we went on the air in January of 1968. Hmm. And uh, I was traffic manager a while, and then I became the uh, promotion director of the station for a year, year and a half. And then I got the title of assistant program director because I always wanted to make programs. And uh, uh, eventually I wound up finding a job as a program director. This, uh, my first two jobs were in Cleveland, then I moved to Huntington, West Virginia. Hmm. It was a nice odyssey of local television station jobs well, coming up here. I, your folks are still back in Quaker Heights. Uh, yes, they are. Uh -huh. Yes, they are. And so I got married. Uh, had a baby and moved to Huntington, West Virginia. Oh, wait a minute, you got married to... Uh, I got married to someone I met my senior year in college. In, in Cleveland? In Columbus, oh, where Columbus I went to college, Columbus. yes. Columbus. And then we got married and moved to Cleveland where I was working, and she was a school teacher. And uh, we had our first child, and six months later I got the program director job at the ABC station in Huntington, West right. Virginia. And, uh, oh, by the way, back at my independent station in Cleveland, uh, my last job was promotion director slash assistant program director. Well, I got a nice title. I got boy. to play around with the, with the programming. Mm -hmm. My assistant, the program department's assistant secretary, was a young girl named Lucy Salhaney, mm -hmm. who went on to become the first her. female president of any network yeah. at Fox years ago. But Lucy was, quote, my secretary because yeah. I was the assistant program director. Yeah, and we were both kids. We were. She was like 20, and I was like yeah. 24. Uh, known her a long time. So anyway, I moved to West Virginia, and uh, as program director, the first day I showed up on the job, there's a note on my desk saying, "Effective today, you will not only be program director, you will be news director. No salary increase." <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Well, welcome aboard. <laughs> welcome aboard. <laughs> so I would work all day long as program director, and then in the evening have to be back at the station to oversee the newscasts because uh, it was a station that didn't have any newscasts until I showed up. So, but it was fascinating, and you learn. And from all of these experiences along the way, you learn a lot. Sure. So, uh, who were the newscasters? Oh, the I, the actually, the I don't even remember who they were. Hmm. I don't remember. I do remember the sportscaster was a guy who was on that doomed flight for the whole Marshall University oh, football yeah. team in 1970. Hmm. And we lost our sportscaster there in 1970 because he was on the flight. The guy who had sold me my Buick was on the flight. Oh, dear. It was, a, it was rough because Marshall University was the only thing that Huntington, West Virginia had going for it. Yeah. Huntington's about 60 miles from Charleston, and it was a bifurcated market, so we covered both 
cities. Mm. The uh, the CBS station was in Charleston. We were at ABC station in Huntington. But it did get me exposure and a title. Mm-hmm. And then... Uh, and then about eight months into my job, the general manager calls all the managers into his office and says, we're all fired, including me. Oh. And we said, what? And he said, yes, the real estate company that owns us is having a very hard time. So they're going to send a couple of real estate people in to run the television station. And we're all out. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so there I am in Huntington, West Virginia with like an eight-month-old baby. Uh, and no job, but luckily enough, I had made friends with some of the people who come around selling shows, and I was out of work for about a total of three weeks. Uh, I got a job in Buffalo, New York, at the ABC station as a program director, and that was a real television station. Through one of the connections of the syndicators? Through one of the syndicators who introduced me to Mm -hmm. them, and uh, I worked in uh, Buffalo for over three years uh, for one of the most marvelous companies I've ever known Capital Cities Broadcasting, Cap Cities, hmm. which eventually bought ABC, ABC sure. which eventually was sold to Disney. Mm-hmm. But Tom Murphy and Dan Burke were the uh, people running it, and we were so small, everybody knew everybody. We had five TV stations, no one radio station, and that was it. Yeah. So it was a very small family, and Buffalo was a big money maker because at that point in time we sold commercials in Toronto, because we were the number two station in Toronto, which was a much bigger market than Buffalo. Yeah. So for the size of the market, we were making a ton of money. And I worked for a brilliant man uh, who went on to become the president of the ABC-owned stations and uh, taught me a lot about figuring out, uh, looking at different possibilities of how to do things. And we were very lucky. We were there, and uh, we turned the place around from third to first. Hmm. which helped everyone's reputation, including mine. Sure. And uh, even at that station, I was in charge of the newscast. I wasn't the editorial person in charge because I was the news anchor. Hmm. But I was in charge of the budgets and I had to talk to the news anchor every day. And uh, so I was exposed to news a lot. I had been exposed to marketing and promotion in Cleveland. I had been exposed to programming because that was what I was doing. So I was very lucky early on to have, and of course, being a traffic manager, you knew everything about sales and, and those areas. So I, uh, I had a lot of exposure by the time I was 31 years old. To Did you say you were the news anchor here? No, I was the news director. Director. The news okay. anchor was in charge of the content. Okay. But I was in charge of the newscast and the money, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, so then we moved on to, uh, at the end of a few years in Buffalo, actually three and a half years in Buffalo. Cold winters in Buffalo. Very, very. <laughs> Even colder than Cleveland? <laughs> uh, yeah. I like to call Buffalo the, uh, Buffalo is Cleveland without the glitter. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But uh, second and final wife's from, but we'll get to that soon. <laughs> anyway, then we moved to Washington. We have two children now. And we moved to Washington, D.C., where I'm the head of programming for Post Newsweek, the Washington Post-owned TV w- station. WTOP. Yep. They came after me because of my reputation in Buffalo, and they wanted to make me group head of programming for their four TV stations. Mm-hmm. So they did, and I moved to Washington at the end of 1973 or so. And uh, the stations were Hartford, Connecticut, Washington, D.C., Jacksonville, Florida, and Miami, Florida. And I'd fly back and forth and help them because most of their stations were in last place. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was some CBS and there was an ABC, but they were in last place because the people before the new group of management had put on shows like Doctor Who and things like that that weren't getting any audience. So they brought me in to see if I could help. And we were very lucky in the sense that uh, we got to turn them all around in the next three years and they all became very strong, both in news and in programming. And uh, I guess I got a reward for that by uh, getting my first general manager's job in Jacksonville, Florida. Oh, let me go back a little bit. In Washington, we put on a morning show. I did a lot of local programming, and I keep forgetting to bring it up. In Washington, we put on a local morning show at 9 in the morning, and there was a fella in the announce booth. I said, I think he can host the show on the air. His name was Doug Llewellyn who wound up becoming the guy who announced, what was it, People's Court for years? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Doug was a booth announcer in Washington, and we put him on the air the first what time. What years were you at WTOP? Uh, 73 to 76. Was Charles Crawford there then? No, the TOP was run by a fellow named Peter Lund. Okay. Yeah, this, and uh, Got him. bright guy. 
Yeah. Who went on to run the uh, the CBS uh, TV stations mm -hmm. and then had CBS Sports. Sure. I've, I've been very lucky along the way to be exposed to some people who went on to great jobs and be friendly with them. That's helped you a lot, I'm sure. Well, I don't know if it helped me in jobs, but it just no, but helped me in picking up the phone and calling people. That's, that's right. Yeah. The, uh, so uh, then we were in Washington, and I got the job to be a general manager in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, of a CBS station. Now, this was the, the biggest winner we had. It was uh, because it was a three-station market back in 1976. They didn't have independence down there at the time. Mm -hmm. And the station had like a 35 share of the market, which was huge, maybe 40 share. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they sent me down, and all I could think of is don't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> but I went down there as a guy who was like 33 years old, something like that. And everyone on my staff was older than me. Mm. Uh, but That gives you a funny <laughs> feeling, doesn't it? It does. But the way I look at it is every one of these people can teach me something because uh, I've always respected age and experience. Right. And uh, we got along, after the initial few months, we got along just fine with everybody. And they realized I, I welcomed their input. I've been a very collegial manager. I always felt that we're much smarter as a group than any of us alone. And it's worked for me my entire career. I've never had to yell at people or uh, or be mean to people. Mm -hmm. uh, I have fired a lot of people over the years. Once when I had to, it was a hundred people. We'll get to that. But uh, but even in that respect, if you do it right, if you tell them what they're doing wrong, if you give them time to fix it, and then if it doesn't work out, you're respected. And that you know. And so I can do it with a smile. I can do it with a low voice. Without having to be one of these crazy people that I find out here in Hollywood, yeah. um, but I'm jumping ahead. So I was in Jacksonville at the CBS station for about three years, and uh, we actually improved the ratings and did some wonderful things there. Uh, we invented a show called uh, Nobody Ever Asked Me. It's a special; only ran once a year. But I wish people would still be doing it. We brought in everyone from the mayor to the head of the power company to the head, the heads of everything and put them on the stage and had people call in with questions. Hmm. And it worked so well. People just, it made the station loved by the community, but more importantly, it got answers to people. Sure. And it was a nice thing to do. Back then, working for the Washington Post Company, and I worked for them for 11 years in a few different jobs, uh, they cared about the community and they were, they were really wonderful people to work for. Kay Graham was great. Uh, ben Bradley, the greatest the, the most unforgettable mm -hmm. character I've ever met. Mm, I'll bet. He was just a fabulous fellow. And uh, so I was very lucky. I was there with them during the Watergate years, so there was a lot of pressure on all of us to do a good job at our TV stations. Right. And, uh, uh, and then I, did, I had done such a good job in Jacksonville, they moved me to their Miami television station, which was ABC, which was still floundering, still having some problems. It was the last one of their stations that hadn't moved up to number one yet. And I was there from 78 to 84, six years, hmm. starting to get a little more distance in each, in each job. And my kids are getting older. I think when we moved to, to Miami, they were six and nine. And it got to me where I said, maybe I should start settling down now. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, were, they were raised in, in Miami. And actually, both of my grown daughters, who are now 41 and 38 or 39, uh, live in Fort Lauderdale. Mm. So that's their home area. I that's where they grew up. Uh, so I ran that station for, uh, for six years and uh, hired a lot of people who went on to big careers uh, because being the general manager, you get to make sure who you hire as reporters and, and uh, hired a lot of great managers who went on to big jobs. One of my guys I hired in Jacksonville and took with me to Miami as program director is the executive producer of Ellen DeGeneres and mm -hmm. TMZ and George Lopez right now. Really? And he had been president of... Warner Brothers distribution at one point. So mm -hmm. One of my one of my kids. Another one became the president of the Food Channel. Oh, great! Uh, uh, just a bunch of them. the management side did well. On the talent side, I gave Katie Couric her first job in television. She was a producer at CNN, and no one would hire her as an on-air reporter. And I hired her in Miami. I hired Steve Croft, mm -hmm. who's at 60 Minutes. I hired him in Jacksonville. And then brought him with me to Miami because he was that good. Yeah. And they're just, a, I think I made a list once. There's about 30 
on-air people who you would know who I hired over the years. You're not the guy that told Katie Couric she'd never make it in television news, are you? I, she, told, I told her I didn't think she was an anchor. Oh, did you? <laughs> she, yes, she, I, did. She, I think she tells that story. No, that was a guy in, in, uh, the CNN, in uh, Atlanta, at CNN. Yeah. She heard that. No, no, I always thought Katie was very skilled, although I never thought she had the gravitas to be an anchor, and I shouldn't be putting this in the, in the thing. Uh, because of her personality is just as wonderful as you think it is. Sure. What you saw on the Today Show was this person. I never Up- thought she'd make it as an anchor either no. because that, for the same reason. Yeah, she's upbeat, she's wonderful, she's mm-hmm. smart, and she's just fun to be with. And I kept mm-hmm. thinking, if people have seen this for so long on the Today Show, how do you then turn it into anchoring a, a major newscast? But she's doing fine. She's not yeah. doing much worse than they were doing before. They're yeah. just, they've had a problem for a while. And, uh, but she's a wonderful human being. And uh, but I was lucky enough to I can't even remember all the people John Scott at Fox News and, and uh, Susan Candiotti at CNN and just a lot of Richard Schlesinger at CBS White Andrews at CBS if I, I should have prepared a list but there's a lot of people I'm very proud of Boy, I call I them guess. I call them my kids your kids I had a pretty good eye for talent and that I'm I'm not too modest about excellent <laughs> and uh, so I was at the ABC station in Miami for six years. One of those six years, they asked me to stop being the general manager at the station and come out to L.A. and clean up a little production company they started out here. The Washington Post started something called Post Newsweek Productions. Mm. And they had, didn't get anything on the air, and they were floundering around with about 20 employees, and they were losing money. Mm. And they asked me to come out here because of my program background, and I would fly out here for two weeks a month and then live in Miami the other two weeks a month. I see. And uh, what we eventually did out here was uh, close them down to four people. And uh, so we had a very small coterie of people. We tried a couple of shows. Mm -hmm. One that didn't work was Charlie Rose, who uh, just was too soft for syndication, Mm. but a bright guy and uh, exactly uh, two days older than me. And then uh, the one that didn't work that that really wound up working is I'm the first person to put Larry King on national TV in 1982. He was doing a mutual radio show from midnight to five, Mm -hmm. and I contacted him, and I wanted to do a Monday through Friday show with Larry. Uh, His bosses at mutual radio wouldn't allow it. They didn't want him to be tired from midnight to five. Mm -hmm. But they did allow us to do a Sunday night show, 11.30 to 1.00 which we did for about two years out of Washington, D.C., in syndication. And, uh, and even when I see Larry now, he says, this was my first TV boss. <laughs> <laughs> but Larry was brilliant. And, you know, he's yeah. had a good run. And, uh, he has indeed. And, but after that, I, was, uh, I went back to Miami. After about a year when we got the company down to virtually no employees and had one show that was working, they said, would you like to go back and run the station? The guy that replaced you is moving on. I said, sure, since I had never sold my house or left town. So I ran the station another couple of years. And then in the middle 80s, we were appro- I was approached by a KKR, a leveraged buyout firm, who was buying the CBS station in Miami from Wometco. Hmm. And I was never going to leave Post Newsweek. 11 years, great people, loved me. Uh, but KKR came in with, as they say, an offer you can't refuse. They gave me a little piece of the television station to come over and run it. Hmm. You can't pass that up. Hard to pass that up, indeed. So I went over there, and I took a couple of my managers with me, just a few. And uh, we had now the chore of bringing back the CBS station, which we had buried as the ABC station, (laughs) 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 which is much harder to bring something back after it once was on top and went below. Yeah. And... uh, so we, that was a very difficult four years. I also walked into a place that had 300 employees, and uh, I'd come from a place that had 100, 190, and we knew we had to fire 100 people. Oh, boy. Not a pleasant thing for someone who I, I think is uh, me, who is a very uh, sensitive guy. But we told everybody in our very first meeting, 100 of you will be gone a year from now. Mm-hmm. Do your job the best you can. We'll talk to each of you. And... Uh, we, we wound up, we had a show called PM Magazine, the first thing I had to take off the air because it was losing money and I had too many people. And instead of just firing everybody and making them go away, we sat there for a few weeks figuring out who the good people on PM were and who the weaker people in the newsroom were. And we wound up 
substituting the best people on one show for the for the weakest people on another show mm -hmm. to strengthen the place. It's still tough. It was a very difficult year for all of us who had come over there. I'm sure. But uh, we did it in a way where nobody was mad at the way we did it. And we made sure we did severance packages and got it. But I, I dislike firing people. I've always disliked firing people. You have to do it when you have to do it. Yeah. But it's not something you want to do. Uh, Anyway, we turned that station around, first by lowering it by 100 people, and secondly by buying some shows that worked. Mm -hmm. um, it was neck and neck with my old station. It didn't quite make it. <laughs> it was close. Yeah. And uh, uh, I was there until late 88, when we, turned the, when we sold the station to NBC. And NBC came in and said, we want our own people you're going to have to leave, and that's okay, because we all expected to leave mm -hmm. once we sold it to a new owner. Uh, working for KKR was very interesting. Because they were a leveraged buyout company, they didn't want to spend money on capital improvements and things like that. They wanted to just get the station to be strong enough to be sold for more money than they bought it for. Mm -hmm. But the nice news is that uh, I made a few bucks on that, which helped me a little. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah it was very helpful, and so did my people. Mm. And so now it's the end of 1988, and uh, I am without a job for the second time in my life, but this time... And you don't own part of the station anymore? No, but I cashed it in, so it wasn't, it, it wasn't as bad as the first time. Yeah. So I took a few months off to decide what I wanted to do, and I decided content is king, and I no longer want to spend time in television stations. Mm -hmm. So I spent the first 22 years of my life in television stations, and now I wanted to come out to Los Angeles or at least be involved in making shows mm -hmm. uh, because I felt no matter what goes on in the ups and downs of the TV business, people always need product. Sure. So uh, in 1989, out of the blue, I get a phone call from Scripps Howard uh, who wants to get into the production business and knew about me. And they were a Cincinnati-based company who owned newspapers and TV stations. Mm -hmm. And they made me president of Scripps Howard Productions, wow. whatever, which was me. Yeah, I was you. I was the entire company. Wow! And I came out to L.A. and set up uh, those free rental offices. I had one in Fox Tower Building, mm -hmm. where it has your name and your phone number, and you can use the office. But there's no real office there. <laughs> and uh, when you come to town, you can have meetings there, but but nobody knew you weren't from there. Yeah. <laughs> and I lived two weeks a month in Miami and again two weeks a month in L.A. Oh, and uh, at this point, I forgot that while I was with KKR at that station, my first wife and I divorced. Oh, while well, you were after, there. After 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I was still in Miami. And we divorced. The kids already were older. They were, uh, uh, let's see, 18 and 16. Mm -hmm. So... It wasn't so traumatic. No. And I lived just a few miles from my old house, so I got to stay with my kids. Okay. And uh, so now I'm uh, moving back and forth between L.A. and Miami, dating, uh, taking, making sure my daughters know I love them. Your life really has changed. It was a very tough time, it was very, uh -huh. but fun in the late 80s. It yeah. was a lot of fun. So uh, Scripps Howard Productions, uh, the first thing I did there was what's called news inserts. I figured, what can I do to make sure I'm paid for so they won't throw me out? And I made a deal with Kiplinger Money Magazine, with Consumer Reports Magazine, with a green grocer type guy, and did these pieces that you insert in local newscasts at 90 seconds each, mm -hmm. and uh, sold them around the country and gave them to the Scripps Howard stations and brought in enough money that I was paid for, my travel was paid for, and so I was not a burden on the company. Okay. And then we started looking to do other things. And uh, uh, Now I'm beginning to remember, I think, when I first met you, because probably at a NatP convention when you were selling these products, were you? Probably. Yeah. Yeah, we had someone selling them for us, but yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, I was with Scripps Howard for three years. They let me go back and forth to mm -hmm. L.A., but at one point they said, we'd like you in our home office. Well, where's the home office? Cincinnati, Ohio. So now I've managed to live and work uh, after college in Columbus, in Cleveland, Huntington, West Virginia, Buffalo, New York, Washington, D.C., Jacksonville, Florida, Miami, Florida, and Cincinnati, Ohio, mm -hmm. before I get to L.A. Um, and I uh, then was, uh, uh, right before I moved to Cincinnati in 1990, I worked out of Miami for three years, met a woman, fell in love with wife number two, 
final wife. In, Cincinnati, in Cincinnati? <laughs> no, no. She was in Miami. In Miami. She was in Miami okay. working at a television station. Gotcha. And we got married uh, in the last couple of days of 1991. What was her job at the television station? She was a salesperson. Huh? She was selling commercials. Very good. Uh, perfect woman. She worked in the NBA for basketball. She worked in the NFL for the Miami Dolphins. And she worked in radio. And then she worked in TV. Hmm. For me, someone who had that background, Terrific. since I love sports and broadcasting, yeah. we had a lot in common even before we opened our mouths. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> a lovely woman, uh, 10 years younger than me, but didn't want to have kids, which made my life easy. I didn't want to start all over again when I'm 50 years old. Yeah, like your father. Yeah. So uh, we've been married now 19 years and uh, no kids and a bunch of dogs, and we're very happy. Excellent. And uh, she's still selling at Channel 7, mm -hmm. selling time. And uh, so after Scripps Howard, we tried a couple of shows. Um, I can't even remember what we did after the news inserts. We tried something. It didn't work. But uh, I left them because I was out here trying to make deals with major distributors for other things. Mm -hmm. And um, is that right? Yeah. So I, I did something. I can't remember the show. I'm sorry. I'm pulling a blank. We did one show that wasn't so bad. Um, and I was offered a job at Columbia TriStar, which is now Sony. They knew me from my station days. They knew me from this production thing. And they, of all the studios, did not have a first-run production arm. Hmm. They were the only studio left that wasn't doing this kind of programming. I mean, Paramount had done it for... 15 years with Entertainment Tonight and shows like that, and everybody had tried it at something, uh, but Columbia had not. And the boss of Columbia Television said, I want to get into this business. Mm -hmm. So they hired me, uh, and they gave me, uh, they gave me three months to come up with a hit. <laughs> it's not that easy. No. But I was in syndication. I was not in prime time. I was in syndication where I had bought shows and made shows and understood shows. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, getting lucky enough, walking through the door was a young, chubby girl named Ricky Lake, who, uh, who Garth Ansir, the producer and eventually head of, of programming at NBC and the WB, was the producer. And I like the idea. I remember asking, um, how come you're coming to me? I must be your last stop. And they said, you are. Everyone's turned us down. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I said, I don't see how this is not going to work. So we put it on the air in the fall of 93, and the show lasted 11 years and made Columbia about a half a billion dollars wow. in profit. And that helped solidify my reputation out here. Yes. And then after that, we followed up with some other shows. I did a show at Columbia called Dragon Tales for PBS, which is the one I'm most proud of. It's an animated musical show for preschoolers. Still on, I think. Still on the air. Still yeah. on the air, although not any more new episodes. They made plenty. Mm -hmm. Sure. And uh, that took quite a bit of time because uh, that wasn't what my boss wanted me to do. But I had said that uh, this is something I think will work. We found a guy in Orange County named Ron Redeker who had done a book called Dragon Tales, and we thought there was just something very Barney-ish about it. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, as long as you don't waste your time during the day on this. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> so I worked on it at night trying to come up with people to come up with the $17 million it would cost to do 40 episodes. Mm -hmm. And we were lucky. We went to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. They gave us six. We went to Kellogg's. They gave us five. And then we had to start selling off all the different rights, foreign, cassettes, everything was sold off. All that we were left with were the merchandising rights. Mm. which is all we wanted. Sure. And it went on the air and was a hit, and they made a lot of money off of Dragon Tales on Ice and other merchandising events. Yeah. So that was what I did at Columbia. I was then hired away in 96 by, uh, after four years, I was hired by uh, Warner Brothers, their syndication arm called Telepictures. And Telepictures uh, was now run by my old program director from Jacksonville and Miami. Oh, I wound up working for my old ex-employee, <laughs> but we got along so well, and we had for so many years. I he had worked for me for eleven years, and now I worked for him for four. Mm -hmm. And together we had a hit every year. We were very pleased. Whether it was wow. Rosie O'Donnell, or whether it was uh, what else did I do? We did so many shows. Um, we did a couple of game shows, Street Smarts, and uh, Change of Heart. 
these are little singles, I call them. They were on the air five, six mm -hmm. years and made about eight or ten million dollars a year. Nobody pays attention to them. Yeah. But after five years, you look around and you say, hey, that show made $50 million. Sure. Better than a bunch of movies. Les Vunvez was still there. No, he, le he had left well he left before. Already. He had left well before 96. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then the last show I did right before I left was a court show called Judge Mathis, mm -hmm. which was a fellow named Greg Mathis out of Detroit, who was the youngest judge in, in Michigan history who... Uh, who had been in jail when he was 17. Mm -hmm. And I saw this as the opportunity to do a court show and how to sell it, which is from uh, from uh, jailhouse to courthouse was the, what we sold it on. <laughs> and uh, he is now finishing his uh, 11th or 12th season. He's renewed till another two or three years. So that'll wind wow. up being my longest running show that I put on the air. Huh. But I was very uh, lucky and maybe had a pretty good instincts because I put nine shows on in nine years and seven of them were hits. So I'm very, pro very yeah, proud well, of that's that. That's a re real record. Yeah, well, it was. It was. Yeah. And then in 2000, I kind of, just like at the local stations, I had spent over 10 years in making shows and getting them in syndication. I wanted to do something else. And I wound up becoming the head of programming at a cable channel, Hallmark. Hmm. which when I joined was called Odyssey, and I was there for the transition to make it into the Hallmark Channel. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, we were very successful in the first six months of the sh uh, channel. It, it tripled its ratings. I, uh, uh, people were not watching it. They were running all these goody-two-shoes dramas from Canada and everything, and I walked in and I said, this is wrong. We have to be like Nick at night in the afternoon. So people will stop and watch us, and when they stop and watch us, we can promote our other shows. So I remember the first thing I did was I bought reruns of Happy Days, Bewitched, I Dream of Jeannie, and America's Funniest Home Videos, and played them from four to eight. Oh. And all of a sudden, the channel mm. that no one was watching really picked up, like I'll quadrupled bet. its ratings from four to eight, mm. and now we could promote other shows that we had, like Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. Mm -hmm. And it really took off, and I was very proud of that. Sure. Now for the third time in my career? Yeah, the first time in my career was in West Virginia when we were all fired, right? Mm -hmm. The second time I was without a job was after KKR sold the station to NBC, and they came in and said, we want our own people, mm -hmm. and you were part of the people that sold it to us, so goodbye. So I was let go twice. Now the third time I was let go. There's ups and downs in this, although I'd like you not to make yeah. a big deal of it. I'm at the Hallmark Channel. I'm working for Margaret Les, who hired me, a wonderful lady, who's now running the hub for discovery, <clears throat> and she's not renewed. Okay. And two weeks later, the new person comes in and says, all of you people that were hired by Margaret, you're out. Oh, God. <laughs> so Deja vu. <laughs> I've, uh, I lost jobs three times, none of which were based on my performance or anything no. I did. Just, just accident of chance. That's right. But you know what? That happens. That happens. And uh, so then I went into the Internet business. Uh, a few friends and I came up with an idea for an internet company where you can buy clothing and furniture and mugs off a TV show. If you see something you like on a television show, we had a website where you could go to find out where you can purchase this. Mm -hmm. It was a good idea, a little ahead of its time, because our goal was to be able to click on the blouse and on your TV set would show you where you could get it. Mm -hmm. Ten year, now it's that was 2002 or three, and now it's almost 10 years later. Now you can do that. Mm -hmm. Just That's beginning. Right. We were a little ahead of our time. So we yep. played with that. While I was out of work during that period, I was an uh, expert witness in trials, and I did some consulting work. And uh, then the Academy came after me in 2006 to be their COO, which seemed an easy job for me because it's very similar to when I was a general manager of a television station. Yes. There's the marketing and the finance department, and you know, there's mm -hmm. just all these different departments. And Just no programming. No, awards is my programming. Awards is, yeah. Awards sure. is my news and programming. There you go. There you and, go. Uh, and I learned a lot about uh, how pristine it is. I'm very proud of the Television Academy, the way the voting is done and the way they they make up the rules. It's really, until you get in there, you don't know it, is really well done. It's very clean. It's very honest. Mm -hmm. And uh, the accountants are counting, and it's it's a very nice job. Are there still two television academies? Yes, one, there is. One here and one on the East Coast? Yes. Please yeah. explain the two the differences there, between the two. There was one TV academy till 1977. 
It was called the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. Uh, but it had two kinds of members. It had members who worked on shows as makeup artists and stunts and, and actors, and it had a group of local station people from around the country. And the people in Los Angeles didn't like uh, the fellow who is the janitor in Detroit voting on the best show of the year. Mm. And so the argument was the local station shouldn't be able to vote for national Emmys. Oh, and they eventually fought over it and broke in two. Mm -hmm. And the National Academy was based in, became based in New York that currently has 19 regional chapters reporting to it. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the local Emmys, and they also do news and sports and daytime. Okay. Okay. The prime times were left out here under the Academy, not the National Academy, mm -hmm. under this split one. And the prime time Emmys are the ones done by the Academy that I run. Okay. Uh, the primetime Emmys make all the money <laughs> because it's prime time. I would hope. And, and the daytime, which has kind of lost its networks and news and sports are still very important, but they don't make the kind of money that the prime time does. So for years they didn't talk to each other. Um, the last few years since I've been here, we've kind of gotten into a period of detente, and now we talk to each other every month and we're actually trying to do a few things together. Hmm. It's never too late. It'll never go back together as one because the constituents are twofold. One are local television stations, and one are disciplines of making a show. Sure. So if you do sound editing in Los Angeles for a primetime show, you're quite different than someone who's a news director in Miami. Mm -hmm. And uh, they each have their own own place. It's right. It's... Uh, it's easy to understand for me, but somehow the uh, journalists never get it right. <laughs> no. And thus the confusion with people. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So we're the primetime guys. They're the daytime guys. Now you're, you're the CEO. I'm the CEO of, of the staff. Of yes. the staff. I am is the, there a CEO? Uh, the chairman CEO is a volunteer position. It is. And it's elected every two years. Uh -huh. And that's my boss. But for all... I run the staff. But that's not I a full-time job. So no, no, I'm, the, I'm the paid, I'm, I like it, I'm the paid guy. Every two years you get a new boss. Uh, unless the, they can be re-elected for two more. Okay. So I've been there uh, five years, I've had two bosses and a new one coming up at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. So I'll have three in five and a half years. Uh, but uh, the staff is excellent, we do a very good job, we work for 56 governors mm. who are also our bosses. Yeah. The disciplines in TV are broken into 28 areas. Actors, writers, directors, stunts, sound engineering, film editors, main title design. Oh, boy. We have 26 groups. And it's sort of like the Senate. Each group picks two governors. And those two governors serve as head of their group. Mm -hmm. And those 28 groups times two is 56 people who meet once a month as the board. Mm. So I work for 56 board members. Then I work for another 14 executive committee members, plus the five officers. So those are my bosses on the academy side. Do you ever feel inundated by bosses? Well, <laughs> a lot of times I have to answer questions. But yeah. I feel that the, these people are volunteers who care about TV. So just like me, it's wonderful to deal with them. Sure. And then I have a wear a second hat. I'm also the CE, COO of our Addis Foundation, the stuff that does the goody two-shoes stuff, hmm. the thing that has internship programs and uh, inter 700 interviews with television icons and college TV awards and all the good things the Academy does, but we do them through our foundation. I also run that staff because I'm the COO and I report to a separate chairman and a separate board of 35. So when you add them all up, I report to about 100 people. <laughs> but for the most part, both chairmen are the people I keep, yeah. inf I keep informed. They make the big decisions, I carry them out. There you go. And uh, it's a great job for a guy who's 69 years old, let me tell you, because oh, they, don't, they don't mind about the age at all. No. no. And, uh, and it keeps my mind working. And, I, and you know what? To be able to have started doing local kids' shows and directing science shows on television to wind up giving excellence awards for the best product on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel I've come full circle and I'm really excited about it. It's just, I've loved TV my entire life. I love what it can do. We, had, we started a new award at the Academy three years ago called the TV Honors Award. 
is a special award done every year for shows that we think make a difference in American lives. Mm -hmm. It could be shows about uh, cancer, racism, uh, anything you can think of. We don't have categories for it. And we have 100, 150 submissions every year, and we give out eight awards at a special ceremony. And it makes you feel very proud of TV. Because an Emmy is for excellence in the TV show, but it's partly popularity. The honors is judged by a judging panel. And it could be anything from Stand Up to Cancer, which CBS did, to an episode of Boston Legal on uh, homosexuality that won an award. Mm. It, it could be anything on TV that makes a statement and helps society understand things better. And it's gone yeah. to PBS, and it's gone to cable. And I think I'm probably more proud of that than anything. Because that, at least, yeah. is not only honoring excellence, it's honoring something that makes a difference. Anything that keeps television from being a vast wasteland. That's true. Yeah. And I do believe right now that we are in the golden age of drama. Mm -hmm. I think it's the greatest dramas in the history of TV are all on at one time right now. Mm -hmm. uh, cable has done a big part of that. Uh, I'm not so sure about the comedies. Uh, they have yeah. and flow, but uh, when they look back at the golden age of, of studio uh, Playhouse 90 and, and, and Studio, or whatever that was called, One. Studio One. Uh, they were wonderful and live, but if you look at them now, they were slow and... And, and very belabored, and you could see people reading cue cards. Yes, and, uh, or when Martin Kane's uh, uh, entire set fell down behind him on a, on yeah. a detective <laughs> show in the early 50s. Yeah. We seem to remember those things, <laughs> you know? And I collect TV and radio. Uh, I collect all the Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis, Colgate Comedy Hours, which to me, they were the greatest thing, uh, greatest comedy team ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I do collect radio shows from Jack Benny to Amos and Andy to Phil Harris to, you name the comedy, Fred Allen, I have them. Because I find driving in the car, there's nothing as delightful as it's, listening to radio. That's true. And I told B. Wayne when I first met her, how thrilled I was. And she's looking at me, this, quote, kid. Yeah. And uh, I said, yeah, you had three number one records in 1938. And she almost fell over. <laughs> and I, I, I just cherish the history of our business and the people who got us to where we are now and the people who are getting us now to the next step. That's right. And uh, I'm a real softy when it comes to that. I've, I've had a career in local television. I've had a career in producing and overseeing shows for syndication. I've had a little career in cable. I've had some career in the internet. And now I've had a career in awarding things. And uh, each one is wonderful to, mm. unto its own, right? A miraculous career, I would say, to be able to count on all of the, as we used to say, collect all those experience coupons and cash them in yeah, it's, over the years. It's, uh, you go to work every day saying, what's going to happen today that's, yeah. going, to, that's going to be uh, fun? Because yeah. there's always frustration. There's yeah. always pressure. But I've always been but upbeat the, on the fact that it might be something new today. It's fun to remember the fun things. Yes. That's for and, sure. and I wish my parents were here so I could tell them that I've, I've met and talked to Betty White and Carl Reiner and all the people you used to watch on black and white yeah. television in my little living room and in Cleveland. still here. And, and, and it makes me feel so warm and great inside to know how proud they'd be that, I'm sure. that a kid in, in, you know, in watching black and white TV in Cleveland would be exposed to all these kinds of people. And some of them I helped make into stars and some others are stars that I got to meet. And I got to tell you, it's just wonderful. It Mr. Really Mr. And Mrs. Paris's little boy in Shaker Heights, yes. done good, as they say. Poor Shaker Heights. Let's, ne let's never Shaker forget that part. Yeah, that's all the poor Shaker Heights. That's right. <laughs> it's. Uh, I, I'm trying to think of some anecdotes. There's so many that you know. <laughs> when we were talking about wrestling before, I have a wrestling story to tell you. I directed wrestling for a while at, in Cleveland at the Independent Station, and uh, even though I was the traffic manager, they let me direct the wrestling. Mm -hmm. And there was a fellow who uh, set up the ring every week. And he wanted to every, we shot two shows on a Sunday, and he wanted to be a wrestler. And he went to the promoter and said, I want to be a wrestler. And the promoter said, you got to have a gimmick. So he came up with a gimmick. His gimmick was, he had a manager who was a little pig. <laughs> and he'd come into the ring and tie the pig to the turnbuckle on the side. And he'd go out, and he'd promptly be getting killed. And then he'd crawl over to the pig, his manager, who would oink something in his ear. <laughs> and he'd go back into the ring and win. Oh, that was his act. That was his act. And he did it for three weeks, and it was great, and everybody loved it. And then the promoter said, what else you got? 
And the guy says, that's it. And he was back to setting up the ring after that. <laughs> oh, that was it. <laughs> I thought you were going to tell me he, he ate the pig. No, I don't know what happened to the pig. But it's, it's, it's pretty funny, some of the things that happen in your life yeah. that, that just flash to mind at one point or another. Gosh. It, uh, well, have yeah. we brought everything up to date now? You have the resume of the, uh, the jobs. Yep. You have the resume okay. of the family life, two wives, two kids, three dogs. Does your present wife work? Is she? Uh... Yes, she works at Channel Seven selling commercials. Oh, really? What she was doing Very when nice. I first Makes met her, her selling commercials. Very good. Loves TV. Mm-hmm. This is one reason I probably love her. We yeah. get along just yeah. fine. Uh, still on good terms with my first wife, but it just was. It didn't work. When out. you when you meet your first wife, your senior year in college, and get yeah. married, you get engaged and married all in six months. Mm. The fact that it lasted 20 years was pretty amazing that was to, pretty good. to both of us. That's pretty good even in those days. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's right. right. If, For sure. The only difference between us and uh, go, appearing on Ricky Lake <laughs> as like teenage marriage yeah. is uh, we were smart enough not to go on those kinds of shows. There you go. There you go. <laughs> but it's the same thing. We weren't emotionally ready. And yeah. Uh, yeah. the second time, I lived with my current wife two years before we got married mm-hmm. because uh, I, I didn't want to make a mistake twice. <laughs> and... Uh, so life is pretty good as long as health holds up. There you go. Because at this point in time, that's all we care about. That's you know? exactly right. And uh, I hope to do this as long as they want me there or as long as I feel like it. Oh, I'm sure that will be the case. Yeah. Our plan is to move out by you when we retire. Oh, really? Yeah. Good. Very we good. really want to come out to Thousand Oaks or Westlake. Oh, and, and, well, uh, it's a wonderful area to live. Yes, we've scouted it out already. Yeah, and, it's a lovely uh, area. And uh, it seems to be the... I wouldn't call it the new growth area because it's going to be a while, but any yeah. place that has a Nordstrom's already and a Costco. Yeah, two, you know, co- two Costco's. Two Costco's. Two okay. Costco's, yeah. That's where we're coming. <laughs> two Home Depots and soon to be two Lowe's. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be out there. And maybe three Home Depots. What exit do you live off of? Uh, 23 Freeway up to uh, Sunset Hills Boulevard. Okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. yeah, I just came back from Ventura yesterday and drove by. Yeah. Love it out there. Love it out there. Yeah. There's always some good shows over at the uh, Thousand Oaks Civic Plaza. Too. Yeah, we go there all the time. Yeah. We uh, just saying the other night, having come back from one, how wonderful not to have to drive into L.A. Yeah. or up to Santa Barbara to see a wonderful show. Right, right. Just terrific. Well, we live right, uh, we live on the Beverly Hills side of, of Sherman Oaks. Ah. We're virtually in the mountains up there. Mm-hmm. And it's very convenient for work for both of us. Sure. But when we're not working, we'd like to get further out. There you go. You know, we don't we don't need to be around all that. No, no, and, no longer. Uh, so did I miss anything I want to tell you? you? Know about my career? You know about my? I think we've covered life. the ground pretty well, and we're just about out of time on the okay. CD. So well, I'm, good. I'm going to say it's been a delight talking with uh, Alan Paris, the Chief Operating Officer of the the Motion Academy of Ac- Television Arts and Sciences. Academy the of Academy Television of- Arts and Sciences, That's or right. as they say, the Television Academy. That's what we call but that, ourselves. But that really. Could imply the other one as well, couldn't it? It could. They call themselves the National Academy. So the tel- the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences right. is more precise. Right. Somewhere along the line, one of those governors wanted to brand us the Television Academy, so everybody said, good idea, good yeah. idea. That's we, like that's like the Academy Awards. I get uh, my, my uh, hair bristles whenever I hear people talk about uh, watch the Oscars. Yeah. The Oscars being the name of the statuette, but right. the Academy Awards is the name of the program, not the name. Right. The Academy Awards is the uh, the ceremony. Do you know where Emmy got his name? I forgot. I did know. Uh, after the Image Orthicon to oh, the, that's to right. Emmy. Yeah. Emmy. Emmy. We came Emmy. Emmy. And it was modeled after the fellow's wife who uh, did the first statue. Ah, for she said. must have been pretty. It must have been. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> It weighs seven pounds, and it's it's lovely. And uh, at one point in my life, when I was in Miami, I was the president of the regional local chapter of the other academy mm. because that was the station people. I see. So I've been on both sides of that too. Sure. sure. And uh, but it's it's a pleasure to get to meet some of the people who are pro- more so than the stars, producers and writers. Mm. To me are the real stars. Mm-hmm. They're the real stars. Can't have a television program without a writer. No. That's no, for sure. No. I wanted to apologize before I sign off to people listening to this for the background noise that you heard earlier on. We did this recording in the back room of a restaurant at the Tulica Lake uh, Tennis Club, and uh, there's a lot of noise going on behind us. But anyway, we were able to chat with Alan, and I do appreciate you coming. We've been speaking with Alan Paris at, in the Toluca Lake Tennis Club near Warner Brothers Studios in Burbank, California, on this uh, 14th day of February in the year 2011. 
My name is Jerry Fry. I'm the audio historian of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters, and we thank you very much for listening.